Okay, this is the pre-class lecture video for Monday, <coughs> uh, November 19th. So on for Friday's um, lecture, we talked about adding H plus uh, and then some, nu some nucleophile, either X plus H minus or H plus and then H2O. And what we said was that when we added that to an unsymmetrical alkene, we could get um, formation of a major and a minor product, and that the major product would follow Markovnikov's rule, where H, the hydrogen's added to the carbon with the most hydrogens attached, and the nucleophile then the X minus or waters attached to the other carbon. So in this case, for instance, the H plus would add to carbon B, and the Cl minus would add to carbon A so that this would be our major product. And we talked about the mechanism for that being that you're going to add the H plus to the carbon with the most hydrogens because it will give you the most stable carbocation, in this case a tertiary carbocation, if you add the hydrogen to the carbon with the least number of hydrogens or the most substituted carbon then you get the um, least substituted carbon. In this case, you have a primary carbocation, which we are still not allowed to write the structure for. So the idea that you can add, when you add a, when you do electrophilic addition, you're adding two parts. In essence, you're adding an electrophile, and then you're adding a nucleophile. And when you can add the electrophile and the nucleophile, to one carbon and then the other carbon and vice versa. If that gives two different products, it introduces the idea of reactions that are what we call regioselective. So regioselective are the reactions where you have a major product and that major product is one of several possible structural isomers. Now remember, structural isomers have different IUPAC names. So for instance, in this case, adding the hydrogen to carbon B, adding the chlorine to carbon A, and vice versa, <clears throat> gives me two products that are structural isomers. This would be called what? This would be 1-chloro-2-methyl-propane. And this structure would be 2-chloro, two 2-methyl, two propane. So therefore, since these two products have different IUPAC names, they're structural isomers. So there's two parts about regioselective reactions. The first part is the regio part that says, okay, you form two products that are structural isomers of each other. Therefore, they have different names. Remember, structural isomers have the same molecular formula. The second part is equally important, and that's the idea of selective. What does that mean? Well, selective means that we get a major product and a minor product. And as long as there is a major product, which in this case, this would be the major product, then the reaction is selective. So those two criteria have to be fulfilled in order to have a regioselective reaction. You first need to have two products that are structural isomers and select one of them. If the reaction doesn't produce two products that are structural isomers, it can't be regioselective. And I think we've looked at this problem both in the pre-lecture quiz as well as in the in the online quiz. So if you were to do if you were to add HCl to this molecule, you would end up with actually because each carbon here has two al each carbon in the double bond has two alkyl groups. So each carbon in the double bond has zero hydrogens, you would actually add the H to the top carbon, 
and then the Cl to the bottom carbon, and you would also get then the Cl added to the top carbon and the H added to the bottom carbon. And Markovnikov's rule here says you add the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens, but in this case the two carbons in the double bond have equal numbers of hydrogens, zero. And so therefore you would get a 50-50 mixture of these two reactions, or of these two products. And while these two products are indeed structural isomers, there is no selectivity, and so therefore this reaction is not regioselective because we're not forming a major product over another product. Okay, so those two parts always have to be fulfilled. The regio, the structural isomer, but then there has to be selectivity. And we're going to spend probably a lecture day going through and going through all the different reactions and determining whether they're regioselective, stereoselective, um, which is a term I'll, I'll talk about a little bit uh, later on here. Okay, so I'm introducing this idea. Mark reactions that involve Markovnikov additions to unsymmetrical alkenes, if they produce a major product, they are regioselective. Okay. There's also what's called stereoselective reactions, and we're going to look at a few of those today. So stereoselective reactions are is a reaction that whose major product is one of several possible stereoisomeric products. Okay, so again, we still have this term selective. So if the reaction produces a 50-50 mixture or only produces one product, it cannot be stereoselective. But what do I mean by stereoisomeric products? Well, my example of stereoisomeric products would be things like enantiomers, diastereomers. And that's probably it for now. So you have to form products that are enantiomers or have the possibility to be enantiomers. And what does it take to have the possibility to be enantiomers? You need to form a chiral center. Or form more than one chiral center and you have the possibility to form diastereomers. But the critical part of this is that it has to be selective. So let's take a look at this alkene reaction of HCl plus this carbon-carbon double bond. Now, when I do this reaction, it's possible here, my, my major product of the reaction is going to look like this. I would add H to the carbon on the right, and then I'm going to add the Cl to the carbon on the left. which has a propyl group and a methyl group. So if I look at this product, I actually generated a chiral center here. So it's possible this product could exist is a pair of enantiomers. As a matter of fact, the product will exist as a pair of enantiomers. Why? Because the addition produces a chiral center. But the critical thing now is that, okay, so I can form the D or the L of this product, but do I favor one? Do I select one product over the other? And I should also say this is either the R or the S. So if we come over here, we can see that I can form two different enantiomers but is the reaction selective? Well, let's take a look at the mechanism. So when you add the H plus to carbon, to this first carbon here, to carbon on the right, you form a carbocation intermediate. When the chloride adds, how does it add? Well, a carbocation intermediate has an unoccupied p orbital. In other words, this p orbital has no electrons in it. It's empty. And so the chloride could add to the top lobe, or the chloride could add to the bottom lobe. 
if it adds to the top low by form one enantiomer, if it adds to the bottom low by can form another enantiomer. And what happens? Well, this if you're having a sense of deja vu, this is SN1. 50% of the time we add our nucleophile to the top lobe, and then 50% of the time we add the chloride to the bottom lobe. And so therefore I get a 50-50 mixture of the two enantiomers. Now, back in SN1 reactions, we called that a racemic mixture. We still call it a racemic mixture. But in this case, what it means is this, that for this reaction, although I have several, I have two possible stereoisomers, the reaction is not selective if it gives me a 50-50 mixture. And so for this reaction is not stereoselective. And I will go so far as to say this, that you will have no stereoselectivity if you go through if you go through a carbocation intermediate. I'll even broaden that statement out and say you'll get no stereoselectivity if you go through an sp2 hybridized intermediate. Because when you go through an sp2 hybridized intermediate, you're always going to add something 50% to the top lobe, 50% to the bottom lobe. And so you're going to get a 50-50 mixture, which means the reaction isn't selective. Can't have stereoselectivity if it's not selective. Okay, So we have regioselectivity that deals with Markovnikov, Markovnikov's rule. And then we have stereoselectivity, which deals with Number one, making one or more chiral centers, but then selecting one of the enantiomers or one of the diastereomers over the other. Okay, so that's <coughs> our idea of regio and stereoselectivity. And as I go through the remaining reactions, I'm going to talk about, well, is this reaction regio or stereoselective? So... Now let's talk, um, go back to, chat, to section 8.3, and let's talk about doing anti-Markovnikov addition. In other words, you can take this molecule, and we know that if you add HBr to this, you'll always add the H to the carbon with the most hydrogens and the bromine to the other one. Well, how many reactions have we talked about so far where I can choose one major product and then switch the conditions to form the minor product as the major product. In other words, when we did bromination at room temperature, we put the bromine in the tertiary position. If I raise the temperature to 300, maybe the selectivity, when it became 1 to 1 to 1, the statistics favored putting that bromine in the less selective position, maybe on a CH3. So we had those two conditions that kind of produce different products high temperature versus low temperature. When we used NH2- versus tersbutoxide, we were able to select the two products that we wanted. So in this case, is there a way to do Markovnikov addition as well as anti-Markovnikov addition? And the answer is yes. <coughs> now the first idea is, what is the anti-Markovnikov product? Well, the anti-Markovnikov product is the one that wasn't predicted to be the major product according to Markovnikov's rule. So in this case, for instance, what I know that the Markovnikov product would have the H attached to carbon on the right and the bromine attached to one on the left. Is there a way I can reverse that? Sure. Here would be the example of the H now added to the carbon 
with the least amount of hydrogens and the bromine added to the other, anti-Markovnikov. So the way we do this is we take our HBr, but now we throw in either hydrogen peroxide, so this is your H2O2, or an organic peroxide, which has, which has a structure of ROOR. And so this is going to be a free radical mechanism. So we're actually going to have an initiation, and then we're going to have not really propagation steps so much as we're going to have the second steps of the reaction. So when you take hydrogen peroxide, or if you take R, R-O-O-R, an organic peroxide, so these R groups could be methyls or ethyls, or they could be an alkyl group. When you take either one of these and you heat them <coughs> up, they break apart, the two oxygens break apart to form either two what are called hydroxyl radicals, or you get to alkoxy radicals. Okay, So we break that bond and give each oxygen one electron. Okay, Where have we seen this before? Well, isn't this almost like initiation in free radical halogenation? As a matter of fact, it really is initiation. And then what happens? Well, then what happens is a hydroxyl radical will react with an HBr molecule. So it will break the, it'll abstract the hydrogen from HBr, break the hydrogen bromine bond. We'll get water and a bromine atom. Okay, so really there's the initiation step and then there's sort of a, I suppose a propagation step, but it's not really a propagation step. It's kind of another initiation step. And then here's what happens. Then that bromine atom adds to the carbon-carbon double bond. Now, this should only be a half arrow, but my computer program doesn't draw half arrows. Okay. But here's what happens. If I break this carbon-carbon double bond, and I give each one of those carbons a single unpaired electron, and this bromine then can either pair up with this carbon, the carbon on the left, and its unpaired electron, or it could pair up with the carbon on the right and its unpaired electron. So if this breaks apart and I get two unpaired electrons, I can either form a carbon-bromine bond by the left carbon, or in this case by the right-hand carbon. <clears throat> and so here are my two possibilities. If I form the carbon-bromine bond to the left carbon, I get this radical. If I add the bromine to the right-hand carbon, I get this radical. Now, what's the difference between these two radicals? This radical is a primary radical, and this radical is a tertiary radical. Which one do you think you'll form faster? If you said the tertiary radical, you're right. Why? Eh, Hammond's postulate, all that other stuff. This is the more stable intermediate. So now the bromine has added to the carbon with the most hydrogens because I've changed the mechanism. This is no longer a carbocation-based mechanism. This is free radical. So then what happens? Well, then when I form this tertiary radical, it now reacts with another HBr molecule so I'll break the HBr bond and pair up that unpaired electron with the H dot to form the CH bond. And then, of course, what I get over here is another Br dot. But then that Br dot goes back into this process and goes ahead and reacts with another alkene to produce more tertiary radical that then reacts with more HBr. Right, exactly what we saw in free radical halogenation. Once we initiate this process, these steps propagate over and over and over again. But the key step is this one. When I add my Br dot to the carbon-carbon double bond, <clears throat> I'm going to add the carbon to the, I'm going to add the bromine to the carbon with the most hydrogens to generate the most stable radical.
and then that radical is going to pull off a hydrogen so the hydrogen will now be added to the least or to the carbon with the least number of hydrogens the one that's most substituted and so I get the major product of this reaction is not the one predicted by Mark Markovnikov's rule and so therefore we call it the anti-Markovnikov product so could anti-Markovnikov addition be regioselective well let's take this reaction and now let's add HBr to it along with hydrogen peroxide here's carbon A here's carbon B so if I'm writing my two possible products I could add H to carbon A and Br to carbon B or I could add Br to carbon A and H to carbon B now if this was just HBr what would the major product be if I say A and B if I just did this reaction with HBr on Friday what would the major product be if you said B you're right that's the Markovnikov product but now when I throw in H2O2 what's the major product of the reaction it's that one is this reaction reaction regio selective well I made two products here one is one bromo one methyl cyclohexane the other one is one bromo two methyl cyclohexane so I made two products that are structural isomers of each other did I favor one over the other yes because I formed the anti Markovnikov product okay so HBr H2O addition forming the anti Markovnikov product can be regio selective this is an example where it is okay. if you're saying well what would be an example where it isn't what if I did this reaction you'd say okay well I'm gonna write my products so what am I adding to the double bond HBr so I'll add the H to the top carbon and the bromine to the bottom carbon and then I'll reverse that and add the bromine to the top carbon and the H to the bottom what are these two products they're the same product did I produce two products that are structural isomers <clears throat> no I produced one product so therefore this reaction can't be this reaction is not regio selective why not because I only produce one product there's nothing to select if there's only one product that's formed okay and we'll talk about this more later and what I'll say is you know if you're reacting a symmetrical alkene there's no way it's going to be regio selective because adding the electrophile to one carbon and then adding it to the other carbon is always going to produce the same product so there's nothing to be selective about you can't be selective if you only got one choice and that's how that works what about regio selective well oh, sorry we already did regio selective what about stereo selective can anti Markovnikov addition through the free radical be stereo selective no because what is the intermediate that we go through we go through the free radical what kind of intermediate is a free radical sp2 hybridized up here in this step I'm gonna add a hydrogen to this carbon where's the hydrogen gonna add well 50 percent of the time the hydrogen and the dot are gonna to couple to the top carbon and then 50 percent of the time they're gonna to couple together from the bottom carbon 
So therefore, even if I generated a chiral center, I would be generating a racemic mixture. And so anti-Markovnikov addition, because it goes through an sp2 hybridized intermediate, cannot be stereoselective. I'll produce an equal mixture of two products. Okay, so this is anti-Markovnikov addition. When you have HBr and peroxide, you'll get this product. Okay, so that kind of goes back and finishes up HBr, HCl addition, because we can do it by Markovnikov addition or we can do it by anti-Markovnikov addition. What else can I electrophilically add to a carbon-carbon double bond? I can, it turns out I can add bromine. Now you might say bromine is BR attached to BR. So if this is electrophilic addition, like what's the electrophile and what's the nucleophile? Well, it turns out that one of the bromines will become slightly positive and the other one becomes slightly negative. So in bromination, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two bromines across the double bond to form this, what's called a vicinal dibromide, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to add one bromine to one carbon and one bromine to the other carbon. So if we're talking about the possibility of being regioselective, bromination cannot be regioselective. Why not? Because I'm adding two bromines to the double bonds, or to double bond. So it doesn't matter whether I add the bromine to the left or right carbon, or vice versa, because I'm still adding two bromines, and so I'm going to get the same product. I'm actually not going to get um, products that are structural isomers. Now, could it be stereoselective? Yes because it turns out that these two bromines will add trans across the double bond. And in order for us to understand that, we need to talk about its mechanism. So here on paper is what happens in a bromination reaction. It turns out when the bromine, when the bromine molecule gets near the pi electrons of a carbon-carbon double bond, the bromine slightly polarizes so that the bromine that comes close to the double bond, p orbitals, becomes slightly positive and the other bromine becomes slightly negative. And that extreme will occur until the bromine-bromine bond breaks and I, in essence, added a Br plus to one carbon of the double bond, leaving the other carbon as a carbocation. Now, the big difference here between adding H plus to a double bond and adding Br to a double bond is this. The bromine is a huge atom. And it turns out that the bromine can actually move over both carbons in the double bond and sort of be partially bonded to each. If this was a hydrogen, this kind of looks like our transition state for the hydrogen actually shifting over in a 1-2 shift. Bromine turns out it's big enough to sit over both carbons in the double bond. And you might say, well, why would it do that? Well, number one, it can. And number two, because when it does that, it actually splits up the positive charge, or it delocalizes or spreads out the positive charge to both of these two carbons. Okay, now I'm going to scribble out this delta plus charge because it turns out that most of the delta plus charge is localized on these two carbons. So when the bromine sits on top of the double bond, each carbon then shares the delta plus charge. So what happens is it keeps an individual carbon from having to take the brunt of the positive one charge. You know, it kind of spreads the, I'd say spreads the wealth, but we're not talking about wealth here. We're talking about the deficit. 
So that's kind of spreading the deficit over more than one carbon so that one doesn't have to take all of it. So it only does that because it's large enough to um, bridge between those two carbons. Hydrogen is too small to do that. So the bromine then sits on top of the carbons and makes a triangular intermediate. And this is actually called a bromonium ion. Well, once you form that bromonium ion then, what's going to happen is the Br- as the nucleophile is going to come in and add to one of these two carbons. And right now it doesn't matter which one it adds to, but the Br- is going to bring its pair of electrons in, add to this carbon, and then the other bromine is just going to shift over. So I'm going to end up adding the second bromine to this carbon-carbon, what these two carbons that were delta plus. And so I'm going to make what's called a vicinal dibromide. All of vicinal dibromide means is that the bromines are on carbons next to each other. It's like a 1-2 dibromo compound. And the 1-2 doesn't mean IUPAC rules. 1-2 is like our 1-3 diaxial interactions. It's just a relative numbering scheme, which means they're next to each other. Okay, so the bromine comes in and adds to one of the carbons, and voila, we make our dibromide. Here's kind of the picture. So the bromine being big enough will sit over both carbons in the double bond. Okay, this molecule, this was one, two, three. So this is this is if I reacted the double bond with my the double bond of cyclohexene with my BRs. The way I draw this mechanism out is this pair of electrons comes out to the bromine, the bromine-bromine bond breaks, and then I form this intermediate where the bromine is partially bonded to those two carbons, which therefore have delta plus charges. Now this isn't a transition state, this is truly an intermediate. And then this bromonium ion then has both carbons having delta plus charges. So when the Br- minus decides to come in and add to the carbon, there's now a stereoselectivity introduced in this reaction because the bromine in its triangular intermediate, this Br- plus is sitting up on top, and so it blocks the bromine. So the bromine cannot come and add like this. It can't add from the same face. It's got to add from underneath the ring so that the bromine's then added trans. So the bromine has to add from under the ring, and therefore these two bromines end up trans to each other. So this is what induces the stereoselectivity of that reaction. Okay, which I'll which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay. So if you're doing reactions with acyclic double bonds, in other words, non rings, when you add your Br2 to this molecule, you're going to add a bromine to one carbon, and you're going to add a bromine to the other carbon. But since this is an acyclic system, there's freedom, there's free rotation around here, and it doesn't really matter. Um, I am going to add the bromine um, to give me this product. Now, yes. I generated a chiral center here, but I'm going to generate both the, in this case, R and S are going to be formed 50-50. And so there's no selectivity in an acyclic double bond. And you might say, well, wait, isn't this, how does this chiral center become a 50-50 mixture? Well, we have to go back here. Let's say for the sake of argument we have our triangular intermediate. Well, the triangular intermediate could either be on the top or the bottom. 
And so therefore, if the bromine's on the top, the, this bromine will add from underneath. But if the triangular intermediate was on the bottom, then the other Br- minus would add from the top. And so in an acyclic system, that means that we'll end up with the bromine adding 50-50 from the top or the bottom, depending on where the triangular intermediate came from. I should probably just... So what we're going to be looking at is this. We're going to be looking at the formation of this intermediate versus this intermediate. And so if the Br minus comes and adds from underneath, I'm going to get one stereochemistry of the product. But if the Br minus comes and adds, adds underneath here, then I'm going to get the other stereochemistry of the product. And so therefore, I'm always going to get a 50-50 mixture of R and S, even with this triangular intermediate. So for acyclic systems, there's no stereoselectivity. And of course, there's no regioselectivity because whether I add the bromine to the left carbon and the right carbon or vice versa, it doesn't matter. It's two bromines. Now, when you go to a cy cyclic system, though, that's a whole other story. Because when you go to a cyclic system, now adding the Br2 to the double bond, the bromine could be added trans, and it is tr added trans, and what is the other possible way the bromines could have added? Well, the other way the bromines could have added is cis. And here's one of the most confusing parts about stereoselectivity. When we talk about stereoselectivity, we talk about the possible products. Not necessarily the products that are formed, but the possible products. Right? When I take a double bond and I add the electrophile nucleophile portion to the double bond, I can either add the electrophile to the left carbon and the nucleophile to the right or vice versa. Well, the way I add the electrophile and the nucleophile to whichever carbon, that's the regioselectivity. I can also add that electrophile and nucleophile either cis or trans. Okay. And that leads to stereoselectivity. So in this case, whether I add the bromine to the top carbon or the bottom carbon to begin with, doesn't matter because I'm adding a bromine to the other carbon. So therefore there's no regioselectivity. But I could for add the bromine cis over here and trans over here. And so my two possible products, and this is the key, these are two possible products. are cis and trans. Now, the reaction selects 100% trans and 0% cis. But it doesn't matter, because what I did was I had the possibility of cis and trans. This adding cis gives me a different stereoisomer than adding trans. And the reaction selected one over the other. And the idea of selectivity is not, it could be as little as 5149, but it could also be 100 to 0. There actually isn't a term when something's 100%, we still consider it to be selective. It's just the, the weird way that we, we, the terminology we use. So if it's 5149, it's selective. If it's 8020, it's selective. 
If it's 95.5, it's selective. If it's 100, 0, it's selective. So the idea is if you add the two bromines, cis and trans, you would end up <coughs> with two products that are stereoisomers of each other, and the reaction has selected one stereoisomer over the other. Now, my question is, what's the stereochemical relationship between the product on the left and the product on the right? I said they were that they were stereo different stereoisomers. What specific stereoisomer are they? If you said diastereomers, you're right. Because the top carbon has the same configuration and the bottom carbon has opposite configurations. But the idea of stereoselectivity is, and this is also true for regioselectivity, that selective means 5149 all the way up to 100 zero. So just because this reaction forms 100% trans doesn't mean that the cis is not possible. Oh, it's possible. It's just not going to form. It's going to form at 0%. Okay. So bromination then will be an issue in terms of stereoselectivity when we do bromination on cyclic alkenes. It won't be an issue when we do bromination on acyclic alkenes. It might be later on, but not initially. Okay. So, now we have an issue of this. Let's say I take this and I reacted Br2 with it. Can you write the product using the bold and dashed wedges because I am going to get one stereoisomer as the major product? Can you write the structure of the major product of this reaction? Well, here's how we do that. First of all, I'm going to write my cyclohexane ring, and I know I've got a CH3 attached to that carbon, but I'm not going to put in the bond yet. I'm going to add one bromine to the top carbon and another bromine to the bottom carbon. Now remember, there's a hydrogen down here that's attached, so I'll go ahead and put my hydrogen in. So how do I get the stereochemistry right? I know the bromine's added trans, so how about this? I'll put a bold wedge here and a dashed wedge to that bromine. They're now trans. That's how they added. So what's the methyl group now? Well, the methyl group would be the dashed wedge, and the hydrogen would be the bold wedge. Does it matter whether I write the product like that or like this? Nope, they're the same. Well, I shouldn't say they're the same. They are enantiomers of each other. And so for our purposes, they are the same product because this reaction is not stereoselective in terms of forming one enantiomer over another. It's stereoselective in forming one diastereomer over another. Okay. So, and, and I just will step back here for a moment and say, the, the, rule for stere the rule for forming an antiomeric products in organic chemistry is you need a chiral reagent to form a chiral product. In lab, when we reduced the yeast, we had a chiral reagent, namely the yeast enzymes, which were chiral. In this reaction, we have no chiral reagents. Therefore, I am not going to produce an optically active product. So when I write this product, I'm assuming that the other product, the enantiomer, is also there in a 50-50 ratio. Okay, so it's only necessary for me to write this product 
and I don't have to write it's an anti-tumor. Okay. Okay. What else do we have? Well, other reagents that we can do, other reagents we can do reactions with, are we can add HOH across the double bond using another set of reagents other than H plus H2O. Here's an example of this reaction called mercuration demercuration. Now, when we do when we did bromination when we did bromination here, what happens is is that we almost treat this bromine as if I'm adding a Br plus and a Br minus. So the bromine becomes the electrophile that adds to the carbon, except in this case it bridges over both carbons. And then the bromine is the nucleophile that comes in and adds to one of the two carbons as the carbocation. Well, I can react other large carbocations that will bridge over two carbons. And one of these is mercury. So in mercuration demercuration, what we do is we take mercury acetate and the OAC corresponds to a deprotonated acetic acid molecule. Now mercury is in its plus two oxidation state, or oxidation state, it plus two um, ion, and so it needs two acetates to counter that two plus to make a neutral molecule, to make a neutral compound. So mercuration demercuration involves the addition of a mercury two plus to the double bond. And what happens is, is that in when this mercury reacts with the double bond, it sheds one of these acetates to become Hg acetate and the whole thing having a plus one charge. So this acts like, let's say, a Br plus. So it will actually come over here and it will add to the double bond as an electrophile. So really I should say that this acts as an E plus. And so I added here my E plus to the double bond and then I get the carbocation. And then in a second step we add water to this and now the water comes in and adds to the carbocation and so this is two steps, right? The first thing I do is I would add my water to form my oxonium ion. And then I would, in the second step, lose my H plus to then add an OH to the other carbon. So you can think of mercuration as basically being the addition of E plus and water and you'll add the E plus to the carbon with the most hydrogens, and you'll add the water to the carbon with the least number of hydrogens. Okay. So this kind of goes by Markovnikov's rule. Well, once you form this mercury and the, and the OH, once you've added those two across the double bond, then we have to get rid of the mercury. The way we do that is by using a reagent called sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride is a molecule where what we have is we have a BH4 minus ion. And so the BH4 minus ion actually is a boron with four hydrogens attached to it. And hydrogen we normally think of being positive, but boron is less electronegative than hydrogen. So the hydrogens are all delta minus and the boron is delta plus. And so this is called borohydride because it is a source of H minus, which is called the hydride ion. So the hydride, <clears throat> 
then comes in by a mechanism that I'm not going to get into, but the, the hydride comes in and basically substitutes for the mercury. And so wherever the mercury ended up, that's where the hydride would be. And so the net result is that I've added H and OH across the double bond. And since the mercury behaved like an E plus in its initial addition to the double bond, it added Markovnikov so that the E plus, which becomes the H plus, this added to the C with the most C's. because the electrophile added to give the most stable carbocation and the OH then ends up on the carbon that's most substituted. This one ends on the C that's most substituted. Okay, so that's how the reaction goes. I add mercury acetate as my electrophile. It's going to add to the carbon that is least substituted to give me the most stable carbocation. That's what we saw on Friday. And so when I make that mercury um, carbon with the alcohol molecule, I need to remove the mercury, which I do by adding sodium borohydride. And wherever the mercury was now becomes hydrogen. So this is what's called mercuration demercuration, because the mercuration step is first, and then the sodium borohydride does demercuration by removing it from the molecule. And the net result then is that I add H and OH across the double bond. Well, I've sh kind of shown you how the molecule would be regioselective. Because when I add the electrophile to the carbon-carbon double bond, I'm going to add the electrophile to the carbon with the most hydrogens to generate the most stable carbocation. But it's not necessarily that simple. The reaction will follow Markovnikov's rule which means that the H that replaces the mercury will end up on the carbon with the most hydrogens and the OH will be on the most substituted carbon. But it turns out that when people did mercuration demercuration, as for example, if they took this molecule and they reacted this with mercury acetate and water followed by sodium borohydride. One of the things that they were surprised about was that they formed, in this case, they added the hydrogen and the OH trans so the H and the OH added 100% trans. They didn't get any cis. And so they found that the reaction was stereoselective. Okay, they basically knew that if they had just put one methyl group on the ring and done mercuration demercuration, they would get as their major product the H adding to the carbon with the most hydrogens and the OH adding to the carbon with the least hydrogens. That would be what the major product that they got. But when they put a second methyl group on here and they did the reaction, they found out that the reaction was also stereoselective. And so when they saw that the reaction was stereoselective, somebody must have said, hey, that's like the bromination. 
So therefore, we must have some sort of triangular intermediate being formed where the mercury is hanging out over both carbons. And that's exactly what we have. The mercury then basically is partially bonded to each of the two carbons just like the bromine, just like the bromonium ion. So that means that when the water came in and added, that the water added from underneath, the water adds underneath the ring, and when it adds underneath the ring then, the mercury and the OH group that comes about after the water adds and you lose H+, plus, that they must have been trans. And later on they found out that when you did demercuration that the hydrogen ended up in exactly the same spot as the mercury. And so the reaction turned out to be stereoselective with the H and the OH adding 100% trans. Okay. Now, I think I'm going to call it a day because next because when you we we do this in class it'll be on Monday because of the Thanksgiving break we'll also have class on Tuesday and so I I'm already gone 57 minutes which would be a normal class period, by the way. But the next thing we need to talk about is how we take this triangle, which leads to stereoselectivity, and how we explain regioselectivity using the triangle. And that could take another 10 minutes. So I think we'll just call it a day here. So in summary, what have we talked about? There is a theme. There's always the theme. I've introduced the idea of regio and stereoselectivity, which we'll deal with more uh, on Monday as well as Tuesday and then the week after Thanksgiving. I've introduced the idea that we can do anti-Markovnikov addition. I can add the HBr in Markovnikov fashion. I can add it in anti-Markovnikov fashion. The idea that neither of these are stereoselectivity or stereoselective because they go through either a carbocation or a radical intermediate. Therefore, you will not get stereoselectivity when you do HBr addition, whether it's Markovnikov or anti Markovnikov. Bromination is a new kind of reaction. It's not regioselective because I'm adding two Brs. So it doesn't matter whether I add the bromine to the left or right carbon because I'm adding two bromines. But it does introduce the idea that a large electrophile can actually sit over the double bond, and when you get a triangular intermediate, now the nucleophile has to add from underneath, and when it has to add from underneath, that gives me stereoselectivity in terms of the electrophile and nucleophile ending up trans to each other. Okay, 100% of the time, but that's still selective. You've selected that product 100% of the time. So that leads to the idea of here is a stereoselective reaction, at least with al cycloalkenes. Okay, and then the introduction of a second stereoselective reaction and this is not only stereoselective, but it could be both, stereo and regioselective, where now we're left with, okay, the mercury adds, it's big enough to add and form a triangular intermediate, but now, we're, now we have to rationalize the triangular intermediate in the context of stereo, or in the context of regioselectivity. And so that's what we'll do on Tuesday. And then I have another reaction that could be both regio and stereoselective that once we hopefully understand the idea of
the mercury being regioselective from the triangle, we can go back and do another reaction that hopefully you'll see the same thing. And then we'll talk about a few other alkene reactions. Okay. So it's Thursday night. Um, I will probably be putting, if I don't put the online quiz up this evening, it'll be up on Friday.